Welcome to this video tutorial from the National Union of Students. This tutorial introduces basic concepts of quantitative data analysis and applies them to analysis of the National Student Survey. Let's start by asking why data are important. The word statistics comes from the Latin statisticum, which means state affairs. The word data comes from the Latin datum, meaning given. Both of these words suggest truth, and indeed it's often difficult to argue with valid statistics. As students' unions, we've been moving over the past few years towards a much more evidence-based approach to campaigns and policy making. The NSS was designed to help students to make choices and for universities and colleges to better understand themselves and their students. But as students' unions, our primary use of the data is as a lever to create educational change. Quantitative data analysis uses various terms, which I'll explain before we begin. We start off with a population, which is the group of people that are of interest to you. For the NSS, the population is all final year undergraduate students at your university or college, or all final year undergraduates in the UK, if you're looking at the national data. From this pool of persons of interest, we want a sample. These are the people whose data you'll be looking at. In terms of the NSS, this is the people who actually filled in the survey. It's very important for accurate quantitative data analysis that the sample is representative of the broader population. In collecting the data, you would want a large enough sample to draw conclusions from, and you'd want it to be demographically as similar as possible to the broader population. For the NSS, ensuring a representative sample means getting response rates as high as possible, and ensuring that students from as many courses and demographic backgrounds as possible are included in the sample. Representativeness in qualitative data is slightly different in that it relies on the accuracy of your coding and summarising, but in quantitative data it's the validity of the sample that determines the significance of the results. A couple more keywords. When talking about statistics, we refer either to descriptive or inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics do just that. They describe the findings from the sample, but don't attempt to infer anything about the broader population. For example, saying 85% of survey respondents thought would be a descriptive statistic. Inferential statistics attempt to take the results from your sample and infer things about the larger population. Inferential statistics relies on a sound method, good analysis and interpretation because you're inferring things about the population at large using what you've collected about a smaller number of people. In order to check that these claims are valid, we use statistical tests and significance tests to check the degree to which we can rely on the sample to reflect trends in the larger population. An example of a simple descriptive statistic is a univariate description. This is an individual fact about a particular group. For example, the statement 190 MPs are women. Its full name is univariate descriptive sample statistics. Univariate, because you're only looking at one variable, in this case the number of women MPs. Descriptive, because it doesn't try to infer anything about the broader population, either of women or MPs. And sample, because it's based on an observed group here, women MPs. A univariate description simply states a fact. There's little to contextualise that fact and nothing to suggest what the reader should make of it. A more useful way to use descriptive statistics is to look at two or more variables at a time. This allows you to draw some conclusions or hypotheses from the data. Bivariate analysis looks at two variables at a time to uncover whether the two are related. This means exploring whether the variation in one variable coincides with the variation in another. Here's a table which shows the association between student union satisfaction, as recorded by the NSS, and region, in this case, London versus the rest of the UK. As you can see, it's not very sexy, but it does seem to show an association. London Students' Unions score on average four points lower than the UK average. This suggests that the fact an institution is in London may have some relationship to a lower satisfaction score for the Students' Union, although we don't know what that relationship is. So univariate analysis simply states a fact, such as 190 British MPs are women. Bivariate analysis gives you the context to make your figure meaningful. Showing a simple chart comparing the number of female and male MPs illustrates the difference between the two, especially when it's widely known that women comprise just over 50% of the population. Similarly for the NSS, your institution, department or a course's satisfaction score becomes much more useful when compared to a score from another institution, department, course or the UK average. The trick for a good data analyst is to make their findings insightful and impactful. Release have done a really good job of that here. They've taken two sets of variables, ethnicity and drug use, and ethnicity and stop and search rate. The analysis is relatively simple, but the conclusions are striking. Presenting the data in a clear and comparable fashion makes these descriptive statistics into a powerful argument against injustice. 
Displaying two variables side by side often seems to show an association, but it doesn't tell you what that association is or how strong it is. One of the most commonly used tests of association is correlation. This is a measure of association between two variables and can tell you about the direction and strength of the association. So things like discovering that smoking was associated with dying earlier were first discovered because there seemed to be a correlation between the two. When measuring correlation, we use a correlation coefficient, most commonly described as R. R will always be on a scale between minus one and one, with zero in the middle, showing no association. Minus one is a perfect negative correlation, and one is a perfect positive correlation. An easy way to demonstrate correlation is to use a scatter plot. This places one variable on each axis and visually demonstrates the association between the two. This scatter plot compares the overall satisfaction and students' union scores on the NSS for every institution in the UK. You can see a trend where as one goes up, so does the other, although the points are quite spread out and not in a perfect line. We would call this a low or a weak positive correlation. So a correlation coefficient is a way of assigning a numerical value to the association we see on a scatter plot. Strong positive correlations mean that as one variable increases, the other increases at the same rate. Strong negative correlations mean that as one variable increases, the other decreases at the same rate. The nearer to zero the coefficient, the less association there is between the two variables. We can illustrate a correlation using a line of best fit. The steepness of the line shows the strength of the correlation, and its direction indicates whether the correlation is positive or negative. It's worth bearing in mind that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Showing a correlation between two variables doesn't necessarily mean that one impacts the other. For example, this graph appears to show a negative correlation between GDP and penis size. It's safe to say this is probably not a causal relationship. This graph showing a decrease in Internet Explorer use and the murder rate probably doesn't prove that Internet Explorer made people murder each other, although some who have used it may disagree. It's also fairly unlikely that Facebook caused the Greek debt crisis, but spurious correlations like these are used daily in the media, by politicians, and even by people who should know better. Just because two lines on a graph go the same way doesn't necessarily mean that one caused the other. So why might it look like the two things are related, when in fact they're not? The first option is the third variable problem. This is where another variable that you might not have accounted for is actually the reason behind the changes in both variables. For example, if you look at a graph showing a negative correlation between the number of cats in a street and the number of mice, the obvious conclusion is that the cats are eating the mice. However, this conceals the third variable. A cheese shop has just opened on the next street and has attracted all the mice away. The second problem with assuming correlation to be causation is the direction of causality problem. Coefficients don't tell you which variable causes the other to change. In the cat and mouse example, we naturally assume that the increasing number of cats is causing the decreasing number of mice. However, it could be that these are evil mutated mice that compete with cats for prey, and as their numbers decrease, more cats come to the area because there's less competition. The correlation coefficient accepts either of these as being equally likely. This points to the importance of human input when analysing correlations. We know that it's more likely that the cats are eating the mice due to other corroborating data and our knowledge of the world. This allows us to develop a theory about which caused the other. So if you want to state that one thing caused another, you need to prove causality. Proving causality requires more than just proving an association between two variables. A statistical association or correlation is necessary, but you must also be able to prove temporal precedence, which means that the cause necessarily came before the effect. You also need to consider any alternative explanations for your findings. If you can't reject the alternative explanation, you can't conclusively demonstrate causality. Correlation doesn't imply cause and effect. When you're trying to draw inferences from your sample to make claims about the wider population, you need to be sure that you're accurate. For this, we need to test the significance of your data. What we mean by this is, if your institution has 2,000 final year students and the NSS has surveyed 75% of them, or 1,500, how can we be sure that the final satisfaction figure of 64% represents the views of all 2,000 students? Significance testing is a technique that allows us to establish how confident we can be that the finding exists in the population and what risk we're taking in inferring that our finding is generalizable. We refer to significance levels, and the most commonly used level in social research is 95%. This means that we can be 95% sure that our hypothesis is accurate, and there's a 5% risk that we're wrong. This gives our data a level of scientific credibility and adds weight to our argument. 
So what might our hypotheses look like? We might think that our students' union score is lower than the average for London. We could arrive at this through theory, anecdotal evidence, a hunch, or through other data suggesting that it's true. The question we're looking into then becomes the experimental hypothesis and is normally denoted by H1. But in statistical tests, we don't test the experimental hypothesis. Instead, we try to disprove a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statement that the effect or relationship we're looking for is absent. The question we're asking in our analysis is whether, given the data we've collected and analysed, we'd be likely to see those numbers if the null hypothesis was true. So, using this example, we would ask, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, that our students' union does not score lower than the average for London. The answer is that it is not likely that the null hypothesis is true if we found an association in the data. In statistics, we put a confidence level around this requirement of 95%. That is, we only reject the null hypothesis if we can be 95% sure that the association is a real association. So in order to take a statistically valid approach to examining the association between two variables, we start with the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says that there is no relationship between two variables. Next, establish a significance level you find acceptable, commonly 95% is used. Test the significance of your findings. You can do this using a number of free online tools, one of which I'll show you next. If we can be 95% sure that our hypothesis is accurate, then we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise it stands, as we've not found a statistically significant association between the two variables. A quick and easy way to test the significance of a difference between two variables is to use a free online significance test, also known as a z-test. Clicking on this link takes you to this page. First of all, you select your confidence level. We go with 95%. Then you enter the sample sizes for the two sets of data that you're comparing. Then you enter the values, in this case NSS satisfaction scores, in the form of a decimal and click Calculate. As an example, I'm going to test my hypothesis from earlier that my institution's SU score is significantly lower than the average for London. Remember, we're trying to disprove the null hypothesis with a certainty of 95%. So the two sets of data I need are sample size and percentage agree for my institution and for all London institutions. To get the figures for London, I run a custom report showing the number of respondents and the percentage agree score, and the TechSooner site returns a total and an average. The sample size for London is 42,700, and the average percentage agree score is 63. My institution has a sample size of 1,100 and an average satisfaction of 58. So I input these values into the Z-Test page, remembering to convert the percentages to decimals, so entering 0.63 and 0.58. Click on Calculate. The site immediately tells you whether or not the difference between the two values is significant. In this case, my student union score is lower than the London average to a degree which is statistically significant. So why are significance and correlation useful when looking at NSS data? You can use it to check that the differences you've highlighted are actually worth spending your time on. If a department has dropped one or two points since last year, is it actually a significant drop? Is dentistry doing so much better than medicine, or is it not statistically significant after all? Differences between two sets of data that aren't significant are probably not worth spending much time trying to fix. You can use significance and correlation to bolster your argument. If you can demonstrate a significant association between two variables, it suggests that changing one will change the other. This is particularly true when you can relate other questions to the overall satisfaction question. Thank you for watching. If you have any queries, please contact nss at nus.org.uk.